So let's uh, work out some examples for three-phase systems. And I'd like to, before I do that, talk about the three-phase equivalent circuit. So if we were going to analyze a three-phase system, what we want to do is we want to create an equivalent circuit. I'm showing that equivalent circuit in this by these green shaded areas here. It's really for a Y source and a Y load. We would simply need to analyze just one of these circuits. And what I'm saying by this is I'm saying that you, you could analyze the VAIA circuit, the VBIB, or the VCIC. But it's going to be a lot easier to just pick this one because you don't have to deal with the 120 phase shift angles. And so what we do is we establish first a reference voltage against which we are analyzing everything from the load perspective. For example, we want to know what the input uh, line current is, I line, input power factor, uh, apparent power, P, Q, and so on. Then let's just use one of the phases and analyze one of the phases. It seems very, very straightforward when we look at it this way, doesn't it? But what am I really doing here? Let's just go back to the phaser representation. So when we introduce the three-phase circuit, we introduced it as three separate single-phase circuits that are 120 degrees displaced from each other. We decided, and I've stated, that I can analyze this three-phase circuit simply by looking at one of the phases. So let's clarify a few things here. What we've said is that VA is equal to V phase RMS zero degrees reference angle. If we wanted to find the current in that phase IA, then what we would do is we would say it is the the voltage VA divided by the impedance of that phase. And let's just call it the phase impedance. If I wanted to find the line current in this circuit, and I line current is a very typical quantity that is needed, I line that is an RMS value. That RMS value is easily measured in this three-phase circuit that we're talking about here, right? So we're going to say, okay, I'm going to take my meter and I'm going to measure the line current coming out of a source. I'm going to get a line, an I line value. If I have a voltage meter and I want to know what the voltage is, well, I don't have access to the neutral line. I only have the access to each of the lines. So then I would measure V line to line. And when I state I line, I mean I line RMS. In this circuit, that's the same as I phase RMS. It's the magnitude of IA, magnitude of IB, 
magnitude of IC. They're all equal to each other because it is a balanced circuit. If I say what is V line to line, that would be the square root of 3 times V phase RMS, which is this quantity right here. And that's the same as saying square root, it's square root of 3 times V line to neutral. If I had a meter and I could connect to the neutral point, that would be called a line to neutral measurement. And I may actually say use a phaser representation of I line. If I were to say I line phaser, what I'm really doing is I'm just talking about the reference phase that I'm working with, which is the A phase. Similarly, the V line to neutral phaser in this case is the reference phase I'm working with, which is VA. We have to pay attention to these things because we're starting with a pretty simple circuit, but we will proceed to more complicated circuits. And what we're really discussing is a reference, point of reference, for understanding power factor, power, reactive power, and things like that. So we need to establish those points of reference. In this case, what I am establishing as the point of reference is the source. That's my reference. So the current coming out of the source and the line to neutral voltage of that source are the respective phase currents and phase voltages that we are concerned about. We are picking the A phase as our reference phase to do all of our analysis and then we will go from there. So this must be very clear to us what we're doing. In the phaser representation we can see it right here and we can say okay if I want to find the phase A apparent power, that is VA times IA conjugate. Since I'm also calling this my reference uh, system, I might say V line to neutral phaser times I line. That would be the same as acknowledging an equivalency between these two things, these two voltages, and these two currents. I can go a little further and, and say, because I have established this, and I've established that V phase RMS is the same as what I'm talking about when I say V line to neutral, and it's the same as what I'm talking about when I say V line to line divided by square root of 3. Then I could write the phase apparent power as the V line to neutral times the I line, or V line to line divided by square root of 3 times I line. So I want to make it extremely clear what we are talking about here. There's the phase apparent power. Here is the phase RMS voltage and its relationships to line to neutral, line to line quantities. 
and line quantities if I start to look at the uh, current as well I could say I phase RMS that was what I was talking about here right and so now that I've established all of these things let's talk about power calculations in three-phase systems um, again okay so I've established that for any phase the phase apparent power is equal to the V phase current, uh, the V phase voltage times the, let's use a dot now. Actually, I don't want to use that because it looks like a dot product, right? But sometimes we do, uh, but since we're doing phasers, we need to be careful here, right? So this is just a multiplication of two phasers. And this star here is raised, so that's a conjugate value, right? So recall if I phase equals I phase RMS, as the magnitude and the angle of that phase is actually the power factor angle I phase conjugate is I phase RMS times the negative of that power factor angle <clears throat> okay so I know that and I've established that V phase is V phase RMS and because I've established the source as the reference in this scenario what I, if it's a reference then the angle is zero degrees of the voltage because the power factor angle is really the delta theta of the V and the I, right? It's the angle of the V minus the angle of the I. So the power for a three-phase system, I actually have three of these phases, don't I? This is phaser V phase that I have represented is the same as V A phaser. I also I have a V B which is V phase RMS of negative 120 degrees and a V C V phase RMS positive 120 degrees but I am not really going to use these things right for my analysis so don't need to use them I can do everything in terms of one phase Similarly, similarly, I had the I phase up here. That's the same as saying I A phase. I have an I B phase, which is I phase RMS minus 120 degrees power factor angle. And 
IC phase of positive 120 degrees power factor angle. Again, for my analysis, I don't need these. Don't need to use them. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is find the power. The power in any phase is going to be equal to the V line to neutral. If I don't put a hat over it, that's the same as saying RMS using the nomenclature that we started with, that's what we were calling the phase RMS. The angle is zero degrees times the conjugate of the phase current, so that is the line current at the power factor, the negative of the power factor angle. So that's the same as saying I line RMS negative of the power factor angle or I phase RMS negative of the power factor angle. So the phase power is V phase RMS times I phase RMS at an angle negative of the power factor angle. The total uh, power for the three phase system is S. That's going to be the S of phase A plus the S of phase B plus the S of phase C. That's the same as saying three times the um, magnitude of the um, S's in each phase because the magnitudes are the same. Now they have this 120 degree. You can prove yourself this mathematically, but the 120's don't show up when you combine them. They're going to cancel. So you just get negative power factor angle there. So commonly the S of a three-phase system is represented as the V line to neutral times the I line times three with a negative power factor angle. So that is how you represent the apparent power in a three-phase system using the phase quantities or the equivalent line to neutral quantities. So if we wrote it in terms of the phase that, uh, quantities which we established in this case are the same as the line to neutrals, this would be V phase RMS times I phase RMS angle negative power factor angle. So there you have the apparent power. Well, let's go to using just the line to neutral RMS quantities. So we will again put the apparent power for a three phase system as three times V line to neutral times I line. These are RMS quantities, the negative of the power factor angle. And typically though, we don't have the line to neutral voltage because we can't measure it or the equipment we're working with has a established a rating, not in terms of line to neutral, but instead line to line. So the V line to line is equal to square root of 3 times the V line to neutral. Establishing this point, we can rewrite the apparent power as 
three times the line to neutral. Well, let's rewrite line to neutral in terms of line to line. It's dividing the line to line by square root of 3. Simplifying this expression, we get square root of 3 v line to line i line of the, at the negative of the power factor angle. So this is the most common way that we are going to find the apparent power given measured terminal quantities. So let's talk a little bit about the different ways of connecting the load. We can connect the load as a y or as a delta. So this shows us connecting the load up as a delta load. And what have we really done here? So we have a three-phase source and we establish each one of these things here. That's a the phase source. And we have three of them, right? Because we have three different phases. We now can connect up three different loads. Show this little dot showing that's like a connection, right? So there's our load. And we've got three of them. We connected them so far as a Y. We can take these loads and reconfigure them. This is the Y connection. Here's the delta connection. There's a little shorthand that's typically used. This is a Y and this is a delta. The source we've kept the same way but now what we're going to do is we're going to essentially lift these pieces up here. So it's almost like we say, take this and lift it and stick it right there to create the delta connection. So I'm connecting from A to B. These are connected from A to neutral, B to neutral, C to neutral. The same Z phase. Now if I were to say that the Z phase in general Considering this from the uh, load perspective, I might say Z phase is equal to V phase over I phase. It gets a little dicey here if we don't use our equivalent circuit in finding this Z phase. Let's assume that we had to start from, from here, right? We knew that and we want to go and make it to an equivalent circuit. This, it's a little bit uh, challenging here. We've got, we're saying that the V phase in this case is the phase voltage across the load and the current through the load. And what we're going to do is change it so that we essentially have a V phase prime across the load and a current I phase prime through the load. Uh, or instead of prime I could say equivalent y, equivalent y, right? 
So in this upper case, the Z phase is equal to the V phase Y over the I phase Y. Well, let's use the notations of line to line and line to neutral just to keep ourselves straight here. I have a delta load to start with. have things that I can measure the V line to line and the V line to neutral if I have access to this neutral point right here the I line so in the delta circuit on the load side I have as phase current. That phase current is, as we explained before, if this was A, IA coming in here, IB coming in here, that current would be IAB. So, it's a little bit complicated if we want to think about this in terms of phasers, but we can really make our life easy if we think about it in terms of the line-to-line -line and line-to-neutral quantities. So, this is I line power factor angle. That's what I phase is. We might say that is I line this way as well. And in the vector analysis that we did when we introduced this, we said this would be I phase RMS power factor angle. So the I'm sorry, that's not exactly right. It would I'm going to back up a little. We would have said that this was square root of 3 times the I phase RMS value. There's a 30 degree phase shift. power factor angle is involved there also. But really what we care about oh shoot So the impedance of this delta circuit is the V phase across that circuit over the I phase. And let's just worry about the magnitude of it for now because the power factor angle is going to all work out when we're done. So the magnitude of that impedance 
ends up being what is the magnitude of V phase, V line to line, and the magnitude of the phase current is I line divided by square root of 3. Because we know that I phase for the delta circuit is I line divided by root 3. We also know that the line to neutral voltage, which is established here on the source side, is related to the line to neutral by a square root of 3 factor. So the magnitude of the Z delta ends up being equal to 3 times V that was line to neutral V line to neutral over I line We can therefore decide to establish the ratio of V line to neutral over I line as a equivalent Y impedance. So the delta impedance is Z Y magnitude times 3. There's a factor of 3 difference. So in summary, we can say that the entire phase impedance Z delta is equal to 3 times the, the uh, Y impedance. Or we can say that the Y impedance is the delta impedance divided by 3. At the angles carry forward into this whole uh, relationship. We don't really need to worry about them. That'll just fall out when we're analyzing a particular impedance. So here's an example. What if I were to connect, ha start with a delta circuit and the delta circuit impedance looks like this. There's a negative J and Z sub C. So that is the Z delta. Actually to be a little more correct, negative J X sub C. So what I have is a leading power factor delta connected load. If <clears throat> we want to know what the capacitance of that load is, because it's purely capacitance, there's no real component, Xc is equal to 1 over omega E times the C value. So the Z delta is equal to negative G 1 over omega E C. 
the equivalent y is one third of the delta. So that is negative one over negative one negative j one over omega e three times c. There's a three in the denominator. because we divided by 3. So there's an example. Let's look at this from a circuit perspective. If I asked you to tell me I've got a circuit connected like this, three capacitors and a delta connection. This is C, C, C. What, this is the delta. What is the equivalent Y? it would look like this. And this would be 3 times C, 3 times C, 3 times C. That's because the Z delta equals, I'm sorry, that's because the zy equals one-third of the z delta. Let's look at the power in our delta circuit also for a moment. So I have a source and it's connected to a delta load. And I want to know what's the power of the load. Well, we know that the S is going to be equal to square root of 3 times V line to line, I line, power fact, negative power factor angle for a Y connection, connected load. What is it for a delta connected load? Well, for the delta connected load on a single phase, the V phase measured across the load is actually equal to the line to line voltage. That would be the magnitude of that V phase, right? That's the same as saying magnitude of VAB. That's what's across the load. We know that the current magnitude through that load is equal to I line divided by square root of 3. We know that the phase, the total power for a three-phase circuit 
terms of face or line to neutral quantities. And in this case, it's really important to make a distinction between line to neutral and phase. So if I say this is V line to neutral, this is phase, V phase does not equal V line to neutral. And I phase does not equal I line. They are equal to these quantities instead. So the phase voltage is V line to line. The phase current is I line divided by square root of 3. And then we have the negative power factor angle. Simplifying, we still get the same expression. Line to line voltage times the line current. So regardless of how we connected the Regardless of how we connected the load, we still have the same expression for apparent power. Uh, one more summary. A Y A Y load. V phase equals V line to neutral. I phase equals I line. It's going to be very convenient to analyze the any circuit as a Y because we can easily isolate out a single phase analyze a single phase and then use that analysis to find the three phase system. So if we had a delta load we would want to configure it as a Y so we can isolate out a single phase. The V line to line is equal to square root of 3 times the V phase or square root of 3 times the V line to neutral in this case. If we had a delta load We would first want to transform it to a Y load. So this is Z delta. We would want to analyze it this way. recognizing that ZY equals Z delta divided by 3. We would also recognize that for this low, for the delta connection, V phase equals V line to line. I phase equals I line divided by square root of 3. And to kind of complete the whole idea here, the um, I line is square root of 3 I phase
نمیشه Okay, let's uh, analyze this particular circuit right here. And what we have is a three-phase voltage source here feeding a three-phase load. But this is a practical problem because most three-phase voltage sources have a impedance associated with them. It's not just a voltage. So what would Zs represent? Zs represents cabling, a transformer, or both. We typically would call this a point right here. This is our A, B, C point here as a feeder. And here is our load that we're feeding. <clears throat> so the first question I'm going to ask is what is the load power factor? From this, we don't have to do a whole lot other than look at the load impedance, which is this Z. So, if we, because that information has the power factor angle in it, if you recall the polar representation of the uh, Z for a circuit with phasers in it for phaser analysis is equal to the magnitude of that impedance with an angle phi z and phi z is equal to the negative of the power factor angle so we can simply find phi z by taking the inverse tangent of the reactive component divided by the real component of that impedance, 1.1 over 1.4. And that impedance is Number two, let's find the line current from the source and the system power factor. So the system power factor would be looking at everything in from that point. And so in order to do that, we need to come up with an equivalent circuit. equivalent circuit is just one of the phases so we can just use effectively the A phase which as I said before we have the source impedance and we have the load impedance and the current 
coming out from that source is eye line or let's be consistent I can say that's the a phase current it'll be the same current and the same power factor angle for all three phases and so the I line is the V line phaser over the impedance phaser of the system so I'm going to call this Z cis. Now in this case, what is Z cis? It would be Z s plus the Z. So that is, if we go back and look at our, this is Z and this is the source impedance J.04. It's an inductive impedance. So we have 1.1 plus J, 1.4, sorry, it's 1.4, 1.1 plus 0 0.03, or 1.4 plus J, 1.13. What we want to do is we want to find this in polar form so we can make a division. So, C cis is going to be the square root of 1.4 squared plus 1.13 squared with an angle inverse tangent of 1.13 over 1.4. And that gives us a magnitude of 1.8 and an angle of 38.9 degrees. So the, the line current for that phase is the V line over Z cis. So because we're finding this from the perspective of the source and that's how we're going to define our power factor, this will be our reference point. So the voltage is it's the V line to line value that we were given in RMS divided by square root of 3. We need to find the equivalent per phase voltage, divide that by the impedance of the system, which is 1.838.9 degrees. We know that the line to line voltage we said up here is this value. 4160 volts line to line. That's a typical medium voltage AC line to line value. So that's 4160 divided by square root of 3 over 1.8. We can bring the angle up on top making it a negative. So we know that we have a lagging load. And the final answer is Thirteen thirty four, negative thirty eight point nine degrees amperes. So that's the current that we're looking for. Now, what's the uh, what's the power factor? Just carrying this over from the past page. Well, this is the whole 
phase or current for one line, like that would be the phase A current. This is the power factor angle right here. So the power factor is the cosine of negative 38.9 degrees, which is point seven eight. So we found everything now for that problem. Let's go back to this whole problem here and let's insert the power factor correction capacitors. And what we're saying is we found that this load that we already have, the load power factor was what? Let's go back and look. 38.16 times the cosine of that is what? Did we even find it? I think we skipped that. The load power factor would be the cosine of this phi z. So that is 0.79 and then we found, looking from the source, including the source impedance, we had found that the power factor went down a little to 0.78. Uh, let's see if we can improve the power factor by adding some uh, power factor correction capacitance. So what that shows up as is a it, uh, power factor corrector capacitors will look like a, a negative reactance. Typically what's done in any implementation that involves capacitors is to put the capacitors across the lines as opposed to putting them into a line to neutral um, configuration. So what is this? What this is, is this is a delta, a, a parallel delta connected load. If we want to analyze this, what we need to do is we need to convert this load into a parallel Y load and then the circuit would look like this where these reactive, capacitive reactive impedances are connected across each line to some neutral point and then the load is still connected here in a Y configuration like this. So first of all, what is this in the parallel configuration, we have what we're going to call this impedance ZC. And ZC I'm going to use as being equal to negative J21. So that tells me that this is a capacitor. That's the same as saying 1 over J omega E C across each line and what I I could even find out what capacitance that is I don't remember I mean I don't know what it is we're going to do this in real time so we know that the ZE equals a negative JXC and the XC is equal to 1 over omega EC so the C would be equal to 1 over omega E 
XC, right? We're just going to swap places. So the amplitude was 21, and we're going to assume that we're operating at a 60 hertz frequency. So that would sit mean that Fe is 60 hertz. Convert that to omega e, 2 pi 60. That's 377 radians per second. Plug that into here. Plug this x c value, which is 21, into here. And the C will be one. It, I'm looking at the number I just calculated, and I want to put it in uh, millifarads. So let's see. They had 1.26 e to the negative four. Let me clean this up just a little for posterity's sake. Shrink these things down a little bit. Okay, so if I want to move the decimal point to the right, I could get it in millifarads as, to mo as opposed to moving it to the left which gets me into the microfarad range. Yep, that's right. Okay, so it's a 0.126 millifarad capacitor. That's a reasonable size capacitor. Now, what do I do? The first thing I want to do is I want to find the equivalent ZY so I can put it into an equivalent circuit. So, the ZY would be the Z delta divided by 3. So that's going to be negative J21 divided by 3, and that ends up being negative J7 ohms. That's what the equivalent line to neutral impedance is. And I can have now an equivalent circuit And here's that capacitor, and here's my load. They're in parallel. So I have a capacitor in parallel with an R RL load. And this was my Z source. Well, let's look at this from like, considering this a load and let's find out what the power factor is seen from the source side where this is really what the source really is. This is like your whole feeder. It's like the building, right? And this is where you're going to size your uh, circuit breakers or something off of this. So then what's really important is what's the power factor looking in at this point. So the power factor looking in at that point would be the total Impedance, the equivalent impedance here. These two in parallel. So that's going to be Zc times Zl over Zc plus Zl. And this is a Zcy equivalent that we were using, right? Which is this value here. So the way to solve this problem, and this is a good example of how you do phaser math, and we do this in the class a lot, and you want to practice this kind of thing. The Z equivalent, we're going to do a multiplication, and then we're going to do a division. So we really want these both in polar form first. And then we actually, we can keep them in polar form and find the power factor from that. So we need to convert the ZL to polar form. Did we do that before? 
Um, we did, didn't we? I think. Well, we didn't do the whole job. So let's go and convert the whole thing to polar form. So we're going to take the square root of 1.4 squared plus 1.1 squared for magnitude. That's 1.78. So this is 1.78, and the angle is that same angle that we found here, 38.16. Okay, that's that impedance. This, how do you convert this to, to polar? Well, a negative J is a negative 90. So that's a magnitude of 7, negative 90 degrees. Now what we need to do on the bottom is we need to add these two impedances together and convert them to polar. And so that's going to be the same as taking the load impedance, 1.4 is the real part, plus J, and we're going to have two reactive parts. It's going to be the 1.1 that was already in the load, minus 7, which was the added capacitive reactants. And we're going to end up with a negative imaginary part here. And that negative imaginary part is negative 5.9. So that's what we have here on the bottom. But we want to convert this into a polar form. So let's do that by finding the magnitude, which will be the square root of 1.4 squared plus 1 plus 5.9 squared. That's 6. And the magnitude is going to be negative, the inverse tangent of negative 5.9 over 1.4. And that ends up becoming a negative 76.65 degrees. And we're going to take this whole thing and plug that in here. So what did we get from this whole mess? What we got from this whole mess is this. Go back and look at this. The Z equivalent is equal to the ZC, which is 7, negative 90, times the load impedance, which is 1.78, 38.16, divided by the impedance on the bottom, which is 6, negative 76.65. So all of these magnitudes are going to multiply together or divide. 7 times 1.78 divided by 6 is my magnitude, and my angle is going to be negative 90 plus 38.18, bringing this to the top, plus 76.5. So that simplifies down to times 1.78 divided by 6, which is 2. And 
the angle is just adding up all those angles. Twenty four point six eight degrees. So this is the power factor, right? The power factor angle is the negative of that impedance angle. And so the power factor is cosine of 24.68 degrees, which is 0.91. So what I've done is I've improved the power factor by adding the reactants across the line and I can show that um, I can even find my new my uh, well I have to do a little more work to find the new load current but uh, if I look at this circuit here, what I'm interested in finding out ultimately is if I added this, what does that do to the load current and the power factor? Well, I can make my life a little easier if I decide to define it here. If I knew what the voltage was at the feed, now, in order to do that, I would have to know what this impedance drop here is, wouldn't I? So that makes the problem a little more complicated. And I'm out of time, so I'm not going to be able to do that. That's for the interested student. And you will be solving problems like that when we get into Chapter 2. But um, I'm going to stop it right here and just say, okay, I was able to improve the power factor. I went from 0.79 to 0.91. And now, hypothetically, what does that mean? Okay, say the voltage at the load is known. So I've got this same circuit here. I didn't. Well, I could work this whole problem out and tell you exactly what that is, but I'm just going to give it a name. Uh, I'm going to instead say that the line-to-line -line voltage was measured right here. And if it was measured, let's say it's a little lower than 4160, 4140 volts. I don't know what this drop is here. I also don't know the exact value here. It's a basically a 4160 system, but it's going to be uh, there plus minus 10%. But this is the load that I'm looking into. If I know the voltage, wherever I pick my voltage to be, that establishes my reference. So the current at that reference, it's 4140. I'm saying that's the zero degree point. My load impedance was 2. I have a the 24 point. 68 degrees and this has to be divided by square root of 3. I almost made a big mistake. That's one point off at least on an exam question. So 4140 divided by square root of 3 is 2390 over 2 negative 24.68 degrees. So the current is half of that, 2390 
1195 amps. So what I did was by adding the power factor correction caps, I reduced the current to 1195 amps from what? Roughly, roughly, it's, we didn't do this exactly because of time, but we know that when we calculated the current before, what did we get with it? We got uh, this number right here. What, Thirteen thirty four. So we've improved it from thirteen thirty four amps. That's a lot, you know. So if I could justify the cost of those capacitors because I can reduce the size of my upstream transformer or my and my circuit breaker switch gear that made sense now this isn't a power class but this is a power typical power distribution example and it's a good way to demonstrate the three-phase circuit analysis